Hello and welcome to this lecture for Introduction to Philosophy and today we're going to be talking about Gandhi uh, in the context of our discussion of civil disobedience and we're going to be focusing on um, his particular uh, philosophy which which is goes by the name of Satyagraha, his thinking on civil disobedience um, that he gave, he put these two Sanskrit words together um, to form Satyagraha so we'll talk about that and what it means and, and how it works in this lecture. Um, and we'll see how with Gandhi, the idea of civil disobedience changes from being um, a kind of uh, a kind of individual act of conscience that we saw with Thoreau. And here we, we find it becomes with Gandhi, um, who draws on the tradition of nonviolence and develops um, civil disobedience into a way of solving disputes, uh, social conflict between social groups. And he uses and develops the idea of satyagraha for that purpose. Um, the, the, the purpose of, for, for Gandhi, this was um, about ending the British uh, colonialism in India in the early 20th century. He returned to India in 1915 with that purpose in mind. So we're, we'll sort of follow that story and see how he comes upon this idea of satyagraha um, to respond to um, the problems that he saw at the time. So Gandhi was born in 1869. Um, in an India that was very definitely struggling under the weight of British colonialism. Um, India had a kind of um, nascent cotton, uh, sort of domestic cotton manufacturing um, system before the British arrived. And that was pretty much sort of destroyed by, by the British who wanted to turn India into a supplier of raw materials. Um, which would be sent to serve um, British industry where they would be worked up um, in, in Britain. Um, so it, it sort of deindustrialized de India, sort of ending its sort of tradition of domestic production um, and definitely brought it to a, a sort of very low, uh, a very low level in terms of um, the world economy um, at this time in the 19th century. Um, so Gandhi's born at, at the time when these, when when the, the Indians have been suffering under this yoke for a long time already. Um, but of course, things are happening in the 19th century. Nationalism is sort of taking off in a lot of places. Um, and of course, that's going to spread to India as, as well. Um, and part of the consequence of that is that they develop, say, a movement for national liberation. Um, and Gandhi will sort of take up with that movement um, in the early 20th century when he sort of returns to India from South Africa. So as a young man from 1893 to 1914, Gandhi worked as an attorney and public worker in South Africa. Um, he went there as a young man to, to practice law um, and he spent approximately 20 years um, in South Africa and developed a, a sort of reputation uh, as a fighter for civil rights in that country. In fact, shortly after his arrival in South Africa, um, Gandhi was traveling by train to Pretoria. And despite him carrying a first class ticket, he was thrown out of the train by the authorities uh, because a white man complained of an Indian sharing the space with him. That was pretty common. Indians were allowed to buy first class tickets, but not if they were um, likely to be um, annoying or, or encumbering um, uh, the, the sort of white passengers in any way. Uh, so this wasn't an unusual event, but of course this was the first time um, this had ever happened to Gandhi himself. So as a response, he formed the Natal Indian Congress uh, in 1894 to specifically to protest against discrimination against Indians in South Africa. And in September 1906, Gandhi organized the first Satyagraha compa campaign, the first nonviolent Satyagraha to protest against the Transvaal as Asiatic ordinance that was constituted against the local Indians 
um, and all Indians had to be registered. Their marriages had to be registered or they would be declared null and void. And I think one of the prescriptions of, of the act um, was that Indian women um, had to strip for um, to, so that birthmarks and other distinguishing marks could be noted before local police. And this was very much seen as a, a sort of a bridge too far by the Indian community. So they, um, they, they negotiated to, together, they networked together, they linked up, um, they formed a movement to fight against this. And Gandhi was at the forefront um, of that campaign in, 18, in 1906. So after all this activity, Gandhi returns to India in 1915. And soon thereafter, he takes up leadership of the Indian National Congress, a nationalist movement that was founded in, in 1885. And Gandhi takes up leadership, becomes the head of this movement and starts sort of moving it in a new direction, um, in a direction that's actually gonna prepare it to take power uh, when the uh, when the British Empire finally leaves in the in, in the 1940s, um, so we'll see that that sort of process happen. All right, so let's now talk about Gandhi's philosophy a bit more uh, a bit more precisely here, as that's what that's what our main focus is. Um, but of course, we have to understand some of the some of the history to really get a sense of what Gandhi's um, where Gandhi's coming from with this. But his development of Satyagraha uh, came from a deep insight into the shortcomings of rationality and violence as means of solving disputes between groups of people. Those, those things um, have been thought to pretty much exhaust the options. You have a rational discussion, you sit down and discuss and negotiate. Or if that doesn't work, there's violence. And Gandhi sees that none of these alternatives, neither of these alternatives are really satisfactory or really capable of solving problems. Although rational discussion is the best way to resolve conflict, Gandhi noted that human beings are tend to be fallible, emotional and complex creatures full of prejudices who find it difficult to believe as rationality demands. Um, and of course, you know, we can find lots of evidence for that in lots of places. We we try to be rational. We, we try to sort of um, embody rational thinking in our decision making. But we all know that we're also emotional and fallible and we're quick to anger sometimes and so on. Um, so so for creatures like us who are like that and also full of prejudices, it's kind of difficult to, to behave as rationality demands, it's kind of difficult just to rely on rationality um, to help us sort of make a case or make an argument. On the other hand, Gandhi's opposition to, to violence as a solution was a very deep uh, commitment. And it's, it's one of the things that he gets from the depths um, of his spirituality and his kind of um, his sort of family embrace of, of Hinduism and his sort of deep learning about Hinduism and, and religion um, that he, he does in South Africa. He felt that each human being had a soul and was capable of pursuing the good. Um, and that's really important because it, it means that for, for Gandhi, violence is a way of sort of violating that capacity. Right. To sort of treat somebody, to use violence against somebody is to sort of violate um, their capacity for choosing the good. It's to violate the autonomy of their soul, which can choose to do the right thing. And instead, violence sort of reduces them to a kind of material tool, somebody who sort of can't make any choices other than the choice to avoid violence. So it kind of it, it, it pollutes the soul of a person to use violence. And it makes makes any kind of sort of meeting of souls impossible between people um, when violence is used. Now, arguments for violence um, are typically consequentialist arguments. That word comes from the word for consequences. Um, so it's arguments for violence are typically about consequences. In other words, they make a sharp distinction between the quality of the action and its consequences. So you'll typically find um, sort of these, these arguments in, for example, about warfare, about whether dropping bombs and atomic bombs um, 
is is a kind of justifiable, uh, you know, ever a kind of legitimate strategy in war. And of course, to make that to make that argument work, you have to distinguish between the action itself and its consequences. So the action of dropping bombs itself and the action of killing thousands hundreds of th and thousands of people with bombs. Um, that's the action itself, which is difficult to justify. But if we sort of look at the consequences and then and then people might say something like, well, but on, on the other hand, if if you sort of do something terrible, like dropping a bomb, you may prevent something even worse from happening. Right. And this this is the kind of logic that was used um, in the, the, you know, for example, in the, the atomic bombs that the United States dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima to Japanese sitters in 1945. Um, the, the arguments there were consequentialist arguments. Right? In other words, people would say things like, well, of course, atomic bombs are terrible and very destructive. But in this case, the consequences of doing so may have been that they stopped the war. In stopping the war, they may have shortened um, killing in, in the long run. In sh stopping the war, they, they may have sort of made it uh, way less um, ruinous in terms of how expensive it was to run the war in the first place. So by making a distinction between the quality of the action, the action itself and its consequences, right, you can sort of justify things that look like they're very bad by doing that. So arguments for violence are typically like that, right? They'll say, you know, nobody likes violence, nobody approves of dropping bombs per se in itself. Um, but if you look at the consequences of doing that, maybe it stopped something even worse from happening, right? So it's okay to do bad things if you stop something worse from happening. That's typically the logic of consequentialist arguments about violence. Something bad is okay, is is acceptable or legitimate if it stops something worse from happening. Okay, so that's the argument that, that Gandhi is going to challenge. Now, to see what's wrong with this argument, we, we have to think about the relationship between means and ends, right? And when people make this argument about consequences and violence, they're distinguishing the means um, from the ends. So the means is, for example, the action used um, and, and the fact that it's violent and the fact that it's death and the fact that it means suffering. And that is being separated from the from the ends of the violence itself. Right. So um, typically the argument is um, the means um, of violence, but the end produced is is less violence than would otherwise be the case, right? Or by you know dropping this this bomb, we're actually f ending the war, and therefore sort of ending all of the violence that would have otherwise taken place if we hadn't sort of used this means, right? So it's using a means, um, using a particular means to achieve an end, but but the argument sees means and ends themselves as separated, right? Or it sees them as very distinct. And that's the, the way that you can use something bad as a means to bring about a good end, right? <clears throat> Another argument would be you can kill an innocent person. Now we all agree that that's bad. You shouldn't kill any innocent people. That's not a good thing to do, et cetera, et cetera. But if killing an innocent person is a means to prevent the end of even more innocent people being killed, um, then according to this sort of means and logic, right, it's it's okay. And we've seen that logic used in sort of shows like 24 about if you torture somebody, you can you know do something terrible, and that might bring about an, a better end than would otherwise be the case if you hadn't tortured. So this is the typical logic of 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 this kind of argument about violence. It works by separating means and ends. Now, I think something important that Gandhi takes from karma, this sort of um, spiritual idea in the Hindu tradition, um, karma implies that the means are actually the same thing as the ends. Um, and if, if we sort of characterize karma as this idea that in terms of our actions, we reap what we sow, karma would say to us that if you sow violence, you will reap violence, right? So if violence is, the, is in the means, 
violence will be in the ends as well. You can't separate those two things. You can't do something bad to prevent something worse from happening, because in doing something bad, you're sowing bad things and violence into the system. In sowing bad things and violence into the system, you're making, you're making certain that violence will be reflected in the ends that come out of the action you do. So we, we just can't separate these two things, right? So in terms of uh, means and ends, they're not separated. They're actually in, they're actually mixed up and sort of bleed into one another like this, according to karma. <clears throat> right? If we we can't separate them because the quality of the means will affect the quality of of the ends. If you do something violent, the end result will be to to sow violence into the system, and we will reap violence. Right? So. So we can't sort of we can't separate in, in this way that the argument requires us to, because means and ends are, are interlinked in a very um, a very sort of a very tight and concrete way, um, so that the sort of quality of the ends will reflect the quality of the means used. <coughs> so God is insight about violence. As, and this is what we've just gone over with the means and the ends. Gandhi's insight is that every step towards a goal shapes its character. The goal is not a distant end point, right? It's not a sort of end waiting somewhere distant in the future in terms of consequences. It's already present in the steps taken to prepare for it, right? So if, if the end that we want is peace, that goal has to be present in the steps that we take to be prepared for it. That we steps the steps that we take to prepare for it have to reflect the quality of the end we seek, right? So it's a completely different way of thinking about means and ends. The means and ends are the same thing. What we do, the steps we take to prepare, will reflect the quality of, of the end that we're preparing. So it it, it doesn't make any sense from Gandhi's point of view to say, let's do something bad to prevent something worse from happening. If we do something bad, right, we, we, our steps are, are representing this badness, our steps are bringing badness into the world, and that's gonna be reflected in the end that we create. So this, this sort of phrase of be the change you wanna see in the world is I think a perfect, um, a perfect summation of this argument of Gandhi's right change isn't something that that we can we can sort of we can do bad things and then watch the good consequences right change is something that we have to show it's something that we have to be and and the and, and that sort of step by step changes how the world changes itself right so change is not an end goal change is, is something that we are preparing for at every stage. Um, so I think there's a lot of there's a lot of important truth in that and, and we can sort of see that and we'll see that in a second um, in the way that Gandhi's idea of civil disobedience works. Gandhi is very clear that a nonviolent program he says is not a program of seizure of power um, it is a program of transformation of relationships, ending in a peaceful transfer of power. Right. So you can see the step by step idea at work here as well, that it's um, that a seizure of, of power is, is not is not a sort of single thing. It's a program of transformation and what you're transforming are relationships so that by the time by the time you get to power, all the work has already been done because the relationships, those social relationships have already been changed. You've already done the work of preparing for that change by working on those relationships. Um, and that's the way to prepare for a peaceful transfer of power. So one of the ways that Gandhi um, expressed this idea of Satyagraha was by insisting on this idea of the unity of the head and the heart. So again, opposed to just the idea of rationality, right? to convince people we have to speak to their head and heart at the same time, not just their rationality, but their emotion too. 
And this was the whole point of Satyagraha for, for Gandhi. It literally means soul force. It's a, it's a sort of, it's a force that reaches the soul of, of another person. It was a way of reaching out and activating the soul of an opponent through suffering, what Gandhi called suffering love. Right. So the idea is that people are going to be reached by suffering. Um, people are going to be reached by the sight of suffering and the attempt to sort of reach out and touch um, and activate the soul. So you, you're you're appealing to your opponent's better motives. Right. That's the whole point of Satyagraha. Um, you're trying to activate their soul. You're assuming they have a soul that can be touched. You're assuming they're they can be reached and that you're, you're trying to activate that relationship so that the relationship between the groups can be fixed. That's the whole point. So here we can see why violence is, is never a good solution um, and why violence can never be an adequate solution to social problems and why it can only make things worse um, from Gandhi's perspective. Since violence always has the effect of causing fear and anger, it can never trigger a moral response in an opponent, right? So in Satyagraha, you're trying to trigger that moral response. You're trying to trigger the recognition that there's a human relationship that's been broken by oppression. Um, and you're trying to reach the opponent, reach the opponent's morality. But you can never, of course, you can never do that through violence because that simply causes fear and anger and it shuts down the moral response. Um, so so uh, if we fear, fear and fear and anger, we're, we're worrying about self-preservation and that kind of response is going to shut down um, our ability to engage morally, our ability to sort of engage in terms of our higher self. Um, that becomes impossible. By putting an opponent at ease, on the other hand, you might trigger a process of self-examination in that person, bringing out their higher nature. So you can see here, I think, very clearly the influence of Thoreau. And we spoke about his idea of conscience, that, that it's, it's the sort of moral spark in us is this idea of conscience. Um, and it sort of reaches us above our kind of material nature um, and our kind of obedience to commands. It's the spark of the divine in us. And I think there's there's definitely an influence of that on Gandhi's idea of satyagraha, that you're, you're trying to reach your opponent's conscience. You're trying to reach their higher nature, their sort of moral soul, by, by sort of presenting yourself as a kind of suffering, um, a suffering sort of fellow sold fellow in sold human you're, you're appealing to their morality um so there's so we can see that influence of thoreau here i think very clearly okay let's have a look here and see um in this passage on satyagraha um let's see what we can sort of pick out in terms of uh, what gandhi says here he says, Gandhi, uh, Gandhi says, Satyagraha is independent of material and monetary assistance. Um, it's certainly independent of physical force or violence. And violence is the negation of this great spiritual force. So it's very clear that it's sort of opposed to any kind of violence. It's a force that may be used by individuals as well as communities, political as well as domestic. It's universal applicability. So here we see Gandhi, again, making the case that Satyagraha can be used um, in all cases. Um, it's permanence and invincibility. So it's always the right solution, Gandhi argues. We'll see, there may be a question about that. We'll, we'll see a little later whether, um, whether we can take issue with that, but certainly for Gandhi, Gandhi argues it's universally applicable by men, women, and children, by individuals or communities. He then says it's totally untrue to say that it's a force to be used only by the weak, so long as they are not capable of meeting violence by, by violence. This superstition arises from the incompleteness of the English expression passive resistance. So Gandhi rejects the idea of satyagraha as passive resistance. It's not passive, right? It's an active attempt to, to ignite the, your opponent's moral conscience. And to do that, you, you, have to, you have to be willing to suffer. 
So it's not, it's a sort of active confrontation, right? You, you're presenting your opponent with the chance to sort of confront their beliefs and you're presenting your suffering as part of that charge. Um, so for Gandhi, it's this kind of confrontation. It's not a kind of passive resistance um, because it's, it's not passive. It's actively trying to confront and to make change. So he says it's impossible for those who consider themselves to be weak to apply this force. I think there's a great deal of truth in that and we'll see that in the demands that he makes on the people who do it. Only those who realize that there is something in man which is superior to the brute nature in him and that the latter always yields to it can be effectively satyagrahis, right? So there's that recognition of something superior, the soul, the sort of moral quality of all people which we're going to appeal to, right? So again, shades of Thoreau's conscience there in relation to our kind of material nature, which just goes along and obeys, follows orders and everything else. This force is to violence, Gandhi says, and therefore to all tyranny, all injustice, what light is to darkness. In politics, its use is based upon the immutable maxim that the government of the people is possible only as so long as they either cons as they consent either consciously or unconsciously to be governed. We did not want to be governed by the Asiatic Act of 1907 of the Transvaal. We talked about that earlier, the registration of, of Indians in South Africa and, and the sort of abuses that, that opened up. And it had to go before this mighty force. Two courses were open to us to use violence when we were called upon to submit to the act or to suffer the penalties prescribed under the act, and thus to draw out and exhibit the force of the soul within us for a period long enough to make appeal to the sympathetic cord in the governors or the lawmakers. Right, so that's, that's, the, that's a nice description there, to exhibit the force of the soul within us, right? There's sort of strength in standing up and saying, uh, we're not gonna tolerate this, but we're also gonna not harm you, we're, we're going to present our suffering as a way of changing your mind, um, to appeal to the sympathetic cord, as Gandhi calls it, in the lawmakers. We have taken long to achieve what we set about striving for. That was because our satyagraha was not of the most complete type. All satyagrahis do not understand the full value of the force, nor have we men who always from conviction re refrain from violence. This use of force requires the adoption of poverty in the sense that we must be indifferent whether we have the wherewithal to feed or clothe ourselves. So strong demands made on the, the protagonists here, the people who engage in satyagraha, and we'll see, see that again um, in the next passage. So after a, a massacre of, of the Indian people in um, in Amritsar in 1919, um, Gandhi gives this speech the, 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 the following day in Ahmedabad, um, and effectively he's, he's, he's admonishing his own supporters for their recourse to violence after this act. Um, and it's quite, it's quite striking here that, that, that Gandhi's sort of aware of, of the danger of, of his own supporters, um, taking recourse in violence or resorting to, to violence and is aware of the danger of, of that. Um, he says, those desirous of joining the Satyagraha movement or of helping it must entirely abstain from violence. Um, and listen to where he talks about the English here. And, and this is in a situation where right, the, the English have just um, slaughtered hundreds of his countrymen, um, you know, in, in cold blood, there's no justification for that, of, of course, and people are very angry and people don't know what's coming next. Um, and here's what Gandhi says in that particular moment. He says, English men and women have been compelled to leave their homes and confine themselves to places of protection in Shahi Bag because their trust in our harmlessness has received a rude shock. A little thinking should convince us that this is a matter of humiliation for us all. The sooner this state of things stops, the better for us. They are our brethren, and it is our duty to inspire them with the belief that their persons are as sacred to us as our own, and this is what we call Abaidan, the first requisite of true religion. Satyagraha with that, this is Dukh Sagraha. Right? So, 
that's a very strong message of his own followers to refrain from violence um, in a situation where that recourse was very understandable after this massacre by the British. Um, but Gandhi's well aware of the stakes. And I think he's also he's also well aware of, of the moral high ground here and the way that the nonviolence um, is going to allow him to to take the moral moral high ground and to keep it where which is going to have long term repercussions for the the successfulness of, of, of the movement. Um, and I don't think we should discount that Gandhi's well aware um, of, of these stakes. Um, and, and he's is well aware of the, the force of nonviolence. Um, and of course, he's also a, a aware of what happens um, to people who are suppressed when they use violence openly. The results of that are, are often not positive. People are slaughtered um, in large numbers. So, so Gandhi's aware of nonviolence, not just um, not just as a sort of self-preservation tactic, but also as, as something that's that's going to allow him to take the moral high ground and thereby um, to win important victories um, in the course of this struggle. And here um, we also find Gandhi emphasizing that Satyagraha is based on strength and not weakness. Um, he writes here that I tell you that whilst my friend believes also in the doctrine of violence, and has adopted the doctrine of, viol of nonviolence as a weapon of a weak. I believe in the doctrine of nonviolence as a weapon of the strongest. I believe that man is the strongest soldier for daring to die unarmed with his breast bare before the enemy. So much for the nonviolent part of, of non-cooperation. Right? So, so this is an important point that nonviolence gives you um, a certain strength in, in the struggle and it takes um, a certain amount of a, a, an incredible amount of strength um, in order to, to to do this, and I think we've we've sort of seen that in the way, in spite of the strongest provocations, Gandhi always counsels a response of, of nonviolence, um, and it takes an immense amount of self control, an immense amount of self discipline to keep that going despite provocations. Uh, when you're being pushed, when you're being pushed around, um, you know, in all kinds of ways, uh, when you're in a very tense situation, it takes an immense amount of self-discipline to keep that, um, to keep that focus and to keep that same focus on non-violence. Um, so it takes an incredible amount of mental strength um, to do what Gandhi is, is advocating. And I think, you know, Gandhi's awareness of, of that, he's very, you know, he's sort of, his awareness of that is reflected in how he sort of speaks out and admonishes his followers about the dangers of violence um, when there's any kind of threat of that taking place. Okay, so let's talk about some, a um, couple of potential problems uh, with Gandhi's view. <clears throat> now, although we could say that Gandhi was right, that people are affected by the suffering of others. It may be the case that he overlooked the fact that if they saw that suffering as deserved, um, their reaction would be different. Satyagraha requires an uncommon ability to see past ingrained beliefs if it's going to work, right? So it's this idea that, that there's, there's going to be this meeting of souls based on suffering, right? But of course, we know from experience that some some suffering doesn't move people or it doesn't move them enough to change, whether that's the sort of napalm used um, in Vietnam didn't stop the Vietnam War, um, the killing of black people by police officers in the United States hasn't stopped, um, regardless of how many protests continue. Um, the suppression of Uyghur Muslims in China um, has got a lot of international attention, um, but it doesn't show any signs of slowing down. So, so there's this, this problem that um, it sometimes seems to be the case that suffering, suffering doesn't reach people um, as Gandhi thought it should. And it, it may be that, that there's a lot of work to do to get past ingrained beliefs before that suffering is actually able to do the work um, of sort of 
bringing about a meeting of souls. The second point sort of takes up from the first, but I think sharpens it somewhat. And, and it claims that Gandhi was almost certainly wrong in his beliefs that Satyagraha never failed, was always applicable, and that it could be used in all conditions. Um, and in fact, Gandhi wrote at, at one point ab about the situation in Germany where, um, of course, the Nazis had come to power in 1933. Um, and, and Gandhi wrote about how, you know, Satyagraha might be used by the Jews in Germany. Um, and Chaim Greenberg wrote in 1939, a Jewish Gandhi in Germany, should one arise, could function for about five minutes and would be promptly take, taken to the guillotine. Um, and I think there's a there's a core of truth in, in that, that there are there are some situations where this kind of resistance wouldn't work. You know, there's a huge difference between India, where the Indians, you know, the Indian people are in a, an immense majority compared to a small minority of British soldiers. And of course, there were trained Indian soldiers who were sort of part of the British occupying force, but still they were vastly out outnumbered by the um, by the Indian civilians. Um, Jews in Germany were about in the 1930s were about one percent of the population, so a very very small and vulnerable population. You can imagine if they rose up publicly um, and took their sort of struggle public in in terms of of a kind of satyagraha type civil disobedience, um, it would be very easy to round them up and execute them um, without much trouble. And, and in fact, you know, that's sort of that's sort of the, the course that things took over the 1940s um, as the Jews are rounded up and deported um, and exterminated. So it's very it's very difficult to to take Gandhi's view here that satyagraha applies to to all conditions. I think there are some circumstances where um, this type of civil disobedience um, may not sort of you know where there's a very very vast disparity in forces between the oppressors and the oppressed, or where there's no real sort of interaction of the oppressors and the oppressed. Um, it's much more difficult to have that. Um, to have that kind of meeting of minds and to have that sort of work to bring about change. So I think that's an important thing to bear in mind. And what it tells us is that civil disobedience works in certain circumstances and not others, right? We need certain things to, to, to be there for civil disobedience to work. Maybe we need some kind of history of interaction between the populations. Maybe we need some economic dependence between the populations for it to work. Um, and both of those things were the, were the case in, in, in India. So, so we have to sort of think about those things and think about what makes civil disobedience successful in that broader social context um, <clears throat> and why that wouldn't have been the case. I think that's, that's certainly true. It wouldn't have been the case in Germany in the 1930s um, or other cases in which there are sort of, you know, vast disparities of force. All right, so let's look at some conclusions for this week. We saw Gandhi develop a powerful model of civil disobedience as a strategy for creating social change in a situation of deep-seated conflict between social groups. In Gandhi's case, he sort of learned the practice of Satyagraha in South Africa, uh, where the Indian community uh, was, was sort of the subject of a lot of repressive wars from the governing white community. And he brought those ideas to India, uh, where, where, the, where the majority community of Indians and Muslims were um, suffering under the weight of British imperialism and the occupying British force, um, which didn't leave until India gets its independence several decades later. So Gandhi develops this strategy of civil disobedience for this context. Um, and he, he has he has success in India in sort of creating this, creating this dynamism and develops a series of sort of important events like the Salt March in 1930. <coughs> the Salt March where he, he sort of gathers a, a thousands of Indians together to march to the south um, and sort of and grow and sort of pick salt from from the um, from from the beaches, and of course the reason is because 
the British have, have put a tax on salt and made, made it illegal for Indians to manufacture salt. Um, so, so again, Gandhi uses civil disobedience in this kind of clever ways um, to, to highlight the oppression of the British. The idea of Satyagraha itself, as we saw, drew on powerful traditions of nonviolence um, and an optimistic perspective on people's capacity to respond morally to suffering. And I think that's an important sort of thing to see that Satyagraha works insofar as we we believe in this capacity of people to respond morally to suffering and to sort of have this meeting of souls. Um, so long as we think there's a chance of that, Satyagraha seems to be, you know, a, a sort of potentially effective strategy to use. We also saw Satyagraha makes very strong demands on its followers to conduct themselves with peace and dignity in spite of immense provocation. Um, so it takes it takes an immense amount of, of self-discipline um, and commitment to, to be able to, to continue with nonviolence and to, to sort of maintain the theme of peace and dignity, um, despite of how, how you're being provoked. So it, it, it's, it followers have to conduct themselves, um, you know, in this immensely self-disciplined fashion for it to work. Um, and of course, it, it, it doesn't take very much for those uh, for that self-discipline to come apart. So, so it, it makes demands on, on how followers are to behave. Um, and again, that's part of what makes Satyagraha successful, that there has to be this sort of commitment to doing it the right way, to sort of um, trying to find the morality of your, oppo of your opponent and thereby treating them with humanity and sort of appealing to their humanity um, in spite of everything that's sort of going on, um, and that sort of so it's a it it makes it makes very great demands um, on people to do successfully.